My name is Shannon Morgan, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a Bigfoot Case Files member today by clicking the join button below this video or on our YouTube channel page. Channel members get access to exclusive perks, including two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways with exclusive Bigfoot Case Files merchandise, and more. For a full list of all channel member perks, please see the membership tab on our channel page. As always, thank you for all of your support, and we hope to see you there. 1862 in Rutherford County, Tennessee. It was reported that in December 1862, Private Randall James Hawthorne of the Union's Army of the Cumberland, aged 22 years, passed away from his wounds received at Stones River. Nurse Barbara Stilling, Army of the Cumberland, took down his dying words at his request to be given to his family. Private Randall had been left alone by four companions while attending to personal business. Randall was not worried about being left alone, as it had happened before. Then he heard a noise like a mewing, like a cat way off in the distance. It was coming from way up the line, in the rainy mists where the enemy was probably still lurking. Vigilantes hid in the shadows, out away from the battle lines. He thought that if it was a wildcat, it was a big one. The closer he got, the louder it got. And then he realized it was not really mewing so much as screaming, sometimes going silent, only to rage again. Randall was scared. The scream was now so low and strange, a deep bellowing that he could feel it in the soles of his feet. Randall dropped down a series of limestone ledges and was soon in the valley bottom, flat as could be, with the breastwork showing occasionally off in the fog. It was only 40 or 50 yards away, but he had his first clear look at it. He at first thought it was a big shaggy bear, all tangled up in the breastworks. The breastworks were composed of trees and rubble to fire from behind. The beast was far too large to be a bear, and it stood on two legs, like a man. It had long tresses of wet, matted hair dangling from its arms and big black hands. He could see its cold breath as it panted in the humid air. It put so much fear in him. He cocked and raised his Springfield, but stopped himself from firing. He did not want to give away his position. Stragglers might have been beyond the works, likely drawn by the same screams that drew him. And then the beast saw him through the winterberry bush that he had been hiding behind. It looked up and strayed into his eyes. The face was dark, bluish gray, wrinkled up in pain and anger, and soaking wet from the cold rain. Its eyes glowed red, like they had their own light shining out from inside its head. It bared its yellow fangs and leaned its head back, bridling up at the top of its lungs. And then he looked at the ground, hoping the creature would stop roaring if he only looked away. Randall then heard a crack, and when he looked up, he saw that it had managed to shake loose a black alder, one of those trees that fell for the breastworks. The creature pulled the big tree aside like a toothpick, rolling over the cart and opening up a big hole in the works. It was now extracting itself as Randall stood there frozen in terror. Some of its hair was stuck and it had to tear off pieces of it to get free, and it was coming after Randall. The big creature was limping and coming at him nonetheless. He came to his senses, raising his Springfield again, this time pulling the trigger. But this thing did not fire, the powder was wet. The only thing he had time to do was to recock and try again. Boom. A big puff of gray smoke erupted from the muzzle, and he could not see where it went for a second. He had expected it to be on him at any moment, but it was gone. He could hear it rage again as it disappeared into the mists, and he could hear tree branches snapping as it went. Unfortunately, Randall had alerted the enemy and could see a line of men coming towards him, climbing through the ruptured breastworks. None of them were wearing uniforms. Randall reloaded and fired at them. Then there was a loud bang and darkness. Randall was hit. His four comrades fought off the stragglers and took him to the medic tent, where he dictated this sad and strange story. On April 26, 1871, a seven-foot-high wild man that was covered with hair was reported in Tennessee. A number of people encountered a two-meter-tall humanoid with fiery red eyes. The creature had waist-length hair and a beard. It shrieked at women and ran at great speed, leaping high fences. In winter 1888, in Madison County, Tennessee, 
The grandfather of James C. Wyatt reportedly stated that while he and several cowhands were staying with an Indian tribe, the grandfather communicated with the Indians via sign and verbal language. He was led into a hidden cave, and there he saw a hairy man-like creature. The being was neckless, long-armed, and covered with long, shiny black hair. The only apparently hairless parts were around its eyes and the palms of the hands. The being appeared tame and sat with its legs crossed as it consumed the meat which was brought by the Indian. Crazy Bear, as the creature was called by the Indians, was fed at regular intervals by them that stated that such creatures came from moons which periodically land in the nearby valley. The Indians claimed that over the years, many crazy bears had been left in the woods, put there by the Sky People. The Sky People appeared different than the hairy giants, resembling Indians, but with short hair and shiny clothes. 1905, in Carroll County, Tennessee. Two sisters and their brother were walking home from a party one night, when they saw a thing sitting out in the field beside the road. It looked like a man, but it was covered in dark hair. The moon was reflected in its eyes. The witnesses made no noise, but the creature watched them as they passed. The three children walked home arm in arm with one another, walking backwards to see if it was following them. There was also frequently heard screams like a woman in the neighborhood, from some sort of wild animal. At the time, the area was mostly thinly settling farm communities, with fields and uncleared land. In 1955, in Lawrence County, Tennessee. I am a 56-year-old woman that has never gave a second thought to the life of what people call a Bigfoot. I knew him as Whistling Patty as a child. That is what my grandparents and all the neighbors called him. Our neighbors were far and few between, and every one of them knew the whistling Patty, and that's what they called him. I myself can remember the screaming and whistling sounds as a child. We lived in the deep woods, with no electricity or indoor plumbing. He was always around, and we were used to his sounds, and he would come in for scraps at night. He did not eat any meat, only peelings from potatoes or other veg. He or she was white, with red eyes. Like, as I know, some folks are called albino, I guess. My grandparents were not learned people. They could not read or write. They had to sign with an X, but they knew he was real, and they did not fear him, and they saw him or her lots of times and thought it was okay. They called it him, so I guess it was a male. My aunt, who lived about a mile away, opened her back door one night to throw out her dishwasher and threw it on Patty because he was standing at the back door. It did not scare her because she was so used to him, although she had nine children. She went and got some potatoes because she said he was hungry. Patty was about seven to eight feet tall and did not ever hurt anyone. Patty would tear the bark off trees that my young uncles had built tree houses in. My uncles are still alive. They could tell more than me. Everyone who lived in this area knew him. He always came at dusky dark, never bright daylight. Always as a child, neighbors would sometimes come and tell about Patty that was at their house in the woods or behind their house. The other night, they would give him food too. Even if it was potato peelings, he would take them. We were very, very poor people, and we cooked our peelings for the family to eat. But my mother always made sure that we had a full belly and saved something for Patty. 1968 in Grundy County, Tennessee Brenda and Adkins, a lone witness, became aware of a nauseating smell. There appeared in front of her a seven-foot-tall, hairy creature with an enormous chest and huge arms and legs, and it was covered with blackish-red hair. The creature was growling at first and stepped within six feet of the witness. It cocked its head in a quizzical way, stared at the witness, seemed to smile, and then left and made a blubbering noise as it went away. In summer 1969, in Montgomery County in Tennessee, I was told the story by my father, and I will do my best to remember the details. My dad and a friend, Jerry, were going fishing. I don't know the road names, but I have general information of the location. It was a 30-minute drive from Clarksville, Tennessee. He said they had to drive over an old railroad trestle to get to the fishing spot. There were horses and cows in a field grazing as they crossed the little cattle gap and parked. They walked down an embankment to the Cumberland River and proceeded to fish. My dad said there was a lot of muskrat activity along the bank of the river. They had been there for about 45 minutes, with no fish. 
my dad all of a sudden said something seemed to stop. There was no wildlife noise, no muskrats. He said he picked up a twenty-two and a spotlight and then walked to the top of the embankment. He looked towards the fence line where the cows were with the light. He said he saw a set of red eyes along the fence. The estimated height was seven to eight feet tall. He said he aimed the rifle between the eyes and took a shot. He then heard the impact of the bullet and the eyes closed. He fired several more times and heard impact, but never saw anything after the eyes closed. He went back down to get his pole, Jerry and my dad, Frank, didn't reel the poles in. They broke the line and left. When they got back to the cattle gap, he said there were all the cows, horses, and a few deers jammed up against the fence, and they had to nudge the animals with their vehicle to get across. Needless to say, they never went back. It was around 9 p.m. It was lightly moderate woods, an embankment, and a river bottom. It was a remote area with pasture fields. That's all I know. A week prior to this, my dad had heard that a horse was killed. Its skull had been crushed, hearsay, but my dad and Jerry did pass the carcass of a horse. December 19, 1970, in Cumberland County in Tennessee. While home from college on holiday break, I was visiting friends one night. I had pulled over and was outside the car in a remote area near my home with a friend. While outside the car, some movement caught my eye off a rock cliff on the opposite side of the road and about a hundred feet away. I saw a figure, about seven foot tall, broad from shoulders down through the torso. It had a large head and was covered entirely with dark hair. It was standing upright with its arms straight down by its side. No eyes, mouth, or ears were noticeable. I stood still for 10 to 15 seconds staring at the image, and then it turned to its left and disappeared. There was no sounds made. I hurried my friend back into the car, and I asked him if he saw what I saw, and he said he only got a brief glimpse of a shadowy movement, although I know I definitely saw as described. I have dismissed this as being a person, maybe a hunter in the area, and I was looking upward at the time, so the image could have been distorted but readings of other similar sightings since have prompted me to submit my occurrence. In spring 1974, in Gibson County, Tennessee, a nine-year-old girl and her older brother would take the trash to the edge of the woods where they would burn it in an old oil drum. They had ridden their three-wheeler called the Scat Tracker down the hill to the burn site and started to burn the garbage. They were watching the garbage burn and they heard a low growling noise. So the girl turned her head towards the right where it was coming from and saw something in the shape of a man that was black and hairy. It was walking to the edge of the woods just over a slight hill. She grabbed her brother and said, what was that? They did not know and decided that they should get the three-wheeler and get back to the house as fast as possible. In spring 1974, in Williamson County in Tennessee, my brother and I were out riding our mini bike one afternoon after school at about 4 or 5 p.m. It was the beginning of spring and we were searching for bait to go fishing. We parked our bike on the road, which at the time was gravel, and traveled very little. We walked down a path that was used by a farmer to get to his pasture where he had cattle grazing. As we walked down the path, I felt as though we were being watched. It was an eerie feeling that still haunts me to this day as I recall the incident. Off to my left, and about 30 to 45 yards away, was a hairy creature standing bent over in a slump, raking its arms through a patch of may apples. My brother saw it at the same time. At that moment, the two of us ran as fast as we could, not looking at each other, but looking at the creature over our shoulders. I was afraid that it would come after us, but it stood in the patch of may apple looking at us, as though it didn't know what to make of us. I have told this story many times since that day. Many people laugh in disbelief, but I know what I saw, and it could only be one of two things. Either someone dressed in a Bigfoot costume, or it was Bigfoot himself. Nothing was ever heard at all from the creature. There was no odor coming from it that I was aware of either. My brother and I were engaged in laughter and jokes as we walked down the tractor path. There was a small stream that flowed approximately 30 or so yards from the creature. The area was heavily wooded with hardwood, and still is to this day. In spring 1975, in Roan County, Tennessee. 
The closest water would have been probably Watts Bar Lake, and the nearest road may be Pump House Road, near Highway 27. Sometime around midnight, my sister, Alice, heard dogs barking outside her windows. After going to bed and turning out the light, she was terrorized by a heavy, deep, and powerful scream, like with all of its might. The sound was right outside her bedroom on the front porch. She was terrified and awoke her husband. They ran to her car and came to pick me up at my workplace about midnight. We drove back to their house and turned the car in the direction of the house. The headlights hit the basement door, and standing there at the door was a dark creature about six feet tall. It stood upright and turned and looked at us. This was not a human. It was dark and appeared to be hairy, and it almost seemed to have no neck. Its eyes were large and shiny, and we all three saw it. Similar sightings have been reported in this county. Rockwood lies in a valley below the Roosevelt and Cumberland Mountains. It is surrounded by lakes. We notified the police, but no report was filed, and we have told friends. In summer 1976, in Obion County in Tennessee. This is going to sound strange, but here it goes. I grew up in a small community where something else lived. I have talked to people from that area from three generations that have seen the same thing. If you have never seen it, most of the people that have won't tell you much. They do not want anyone to think they are crazy. I even knew one man who, he's dead now, but he had a relationship with it. He fed it, and it was not afraid of him. Anyways, I've seen it three times during my childhood. One time from about 200 yards with two other people. The other two times, I was alone. One of those times, I was maybe 40 yards away, coming home, and it was in my backyard by a fence. But the last time was very intense. I was walking home from town, about three miles away, and it was pretty dark, so I was looking down most of the time. I was about a quarter of a mile from home, and I turned onto the street that led to my house. I walked about 30 feet, and there it was. It was about 10 feet in front of me. It was down on its hands and feet doing something. It saw me at the time that I saw it, and then it stood up, and we looked at each other for a few seconds, but it seemed like forever. It then ran one way, and I ran the other. Now, we always called it the white thing. It looked like what most people think a Bigfoot looks like, except it is an off-white color. It's about eight to nine feet tall, and my father always said that all of us kids were seeing things, until he found tracks while hunting. I know 30 to 40 people who have seen it, the area is mostly farmland, now close to bottomland from the river. I have talked to people over three generations that have seen it over the years. The really strange thing is that it is white. In spring 1979, in Maury County in Tennessee, a friend and I were taking a hike on TVA land in Columbia, Tennessee. At the time, the area was deserted. My ex-father-in-law owned 20 acres that backed up to TVA, which met Duck River on the way back. We were walking, and suddenly, 20 yards or less away, out of the bush in a wide open area, there he was. We froze, and we all stared at each other. If he had been violent, you wouldn't hear the story. He turned, made an awful growling scream, and then was gone. Later that day, my brother and I went back and searched, only to find a four-inch tree, about six feet up, freshly took and twisted to splinters. The farm was part of our area, and since this sighting, we were not scared, and there were so many times that we knew he was near, but we were never attacked. In December 1979, in Robertson County in Tennessee, my brother and I were on our family farm, playing in the woods as usual. We were in a heavily wooded area with thick underbrush, in a valley behind our tobacco barn, playing in the stream that ran along one side of the barn. We were collecting rocks and making a dam for a swimming hole for the next summer's use. It was late in the afternoon, almost dusk. I kept having one of those gut feelings that something wasn't right, but I couldn't put my finger on it, so we just kept working. I had mentioned my feeling to my brother. I closed the stream with a jump, holding a large field rock, and then I heard a stick break loudly. I looked under my feet, and there was nothing but leaves and mud, so I looked back across the stream at my brother, who wasn't near any deadfall. I had a severe wake-up call in my gut to get out of there. I placed my rock, and I told my brother we had to leave immediately. Something wasn't right. 
He didn't protest, as his hackles were also raised at the time. I retrieved my rifle from the tree across the creek where we had left our weapons. Pump BB air rifles. We didn't get shotguns until the next Christmas. And then we walked to the four-foot woven wire fence that we had to cross. I set my BB gun across on the other side of the fence and grabbed some low-hanging tree limbs to assist my getting across the fence. Once I dropped down on the other side, I turned towards the barn to pick up my BB gun. I came eye to eye with a thing. A huge, black, hairy thing crouched down slightly behind an old tree. It had these huge black eyes, and needless to say, it scared the bejesus out of me. I screamed my brother's name at the top of my lungs, and I started pumping my BB gun for all it was worth. I intended to shoot it in the eyes if it moved. My brother was about 15 yards from me on the other side of the fence getting his BB gun. My next thought was to run for help, so I took off for the clearing some 50 yards away. My brother said he looked at me after I screamed, a blood-curdling scream, he says. He said I was literally as white as a sheet, and he thought to himself, what's wrong with her? He then fired his BB air gun, because it was a long pistol-type model that he stuck through his belt. He said he looked up across the creek and he saw it, only it was out from behind the tree, standing fully erect now. My brother cleared a four-foot fence in one bound, with two pair of long underwear and a pair of jeans on, and he wasn't much taller than the fence at the time. Meanwhile, I'd made it to the clearing and turned towards the woods with my gun ready, looking for any sign of my brother. I was never so glad in my life to see a hunter's orange sock cap bobbing my way. I was crying and screaming for him hysterically. He ran up to me and said he heard it chasing him, but it didn't follow him out of the woods, yet anyways. We ran the whole rest of the way back to the farmhouse, which was about a quarter mile across the main road. When we reached the house and fell on the door, my aunt says, we told her and my cousin about our encounter. They laughed it off nervously, and then my aunt confessed to many sightings and strange occurrences through the years in the area. She told us a man had disappeared off a bridge on a tractor, just below, less than 500 yards downstream where we had been. She said the tractor was found overturned in the creek, but the man was never found. During June 1980, on Highway 31A from Chapel Hill, A 12-year-old boy was working at a construction site off a dirt road for his father. His dad and uncles were building a house for Ricky Sweeney. His two uncles, Ricky and Jimmy, took the work truck to a small country store to get mid-morning snack for the crew. On the way back to the work site, they drove down a dirt road lined with thick, overhanging trees. After a quarter of a mile from the left appeared a creature that was over seven and a half feet tall. It was a slender animal with dark fur head to toe, which ran into the middle of the road as his uncle slammed on the brakes. It was bipedal and 50 feet away. It had extremely large eyes, and the nose was flatter than a human's. The hair coat was dark brown to black, and the hair was long, with most of it appearing to be six inches or longer. The hands were very large, and the large fingers were articulated. All three of them started screaming, and Uncle Ricky was trying to get the truck into reverse gear. The animal had what appeared to be pieces of clothing under one arm and dragging on the road. The animal then broke itself out of its fright and bounded off north to the right side of the road, across the road, and then jumping a a four-and-a-half-foot-high fence with ease and then quickly disappearing up a hill. In February 1981, in Hawkins County, Tennessee, I, my wife, and two sons were living on a remote farm in Hawkins County, Tennessee. One night, around 11 p.m., directly behind the house, a screaming started. It was like the combination of a woman, large cat, and a mule. It took place in a cedar thicket up on a hill. I ran outside in the porch to see what was going on. I could also hear the sound of trees crackling or thrashing. The screaming kept up for approximately one and a half hours. The house itself sat on a bench, surrounded by ridges, or in a bowl, so to speak. Whatever was making the screams and growls did so while circling the house on the ridges. After standing on the porch for a few minutes, the whole time my wife was begging me to come back inside. I finally went back in the house. All I had was a single-shot 20-gauge shotgun, which I loaded. We both sat there, scared to death. We had no phone, and the nearest neighbor lived a half a mile away, down a four-wheel drive road, which was treacherous in daylight. Off and on, I also heard the sound of rocks being hit together. 
It was about 11 p.m. and it was overcast. In spring 1981, in the southern part of Humphreys County in Tennessee, I was turkey hunting with a friend of mine on some land on the banks of the Duck River. I have heard of no reports of Bigfoot in the area, nor had I had seen any signs of Bigfoot around there. So this is probably nothing, but this is what happened. There are a few houses in the area. There are many small valleys, dense hardwood forests, and a lot of cropland planted mainly with soybeans or wheat. It was a good place for turkey hunting. I saw 20 or 30 the day before the season opened, and I was two miles deep in the woods. It was getting dark fast, so I started walking back to the truck on a dirt road. It got so dark that I could not see 10 feet in front of me. Shortly after I started walking down the road, something started walking in the woods near me. It sounded like it was a hundred feet away, but I could not see it at all. I smelt no strange smells, but whatever it was, it kept a constant pace with me. At first, I thought that it might be a deer, because I knew that there's no bears in this area. I wasn't worried about whatever it was at first, because it wasn't coming any closer. It was just keeping pace. So still, I thought it was probably a deer, until I heard it step on a fallen tree. When it stepped on the tree, the tree definitely snapped in two. It sounded like a rather large tree too. I know this because I lived on a farm most of my life and we would clear land with a bulldozer and tractors. So I knew what different sized trees sounded like when they snapped in two. When I heard that tree break, that got my attention because whatever broke it was extremely heavy. I got a little scared too because all I had was a shotgun. I decided to see if it would keep up with me, so I ran, and I ran for about a hundred yards, and it kept up, but it got no closer. I stopped running, though, because it was so dark, and I was afraid that I would trip or hit a tree. This thing followed me for about ten minutes, and when I started getting close to the road, it stayed further, following completely. We slept in the truck all night so that we could hunt the next day, but we heard no screams or strange noises, so I have really no idea what it was. The closest Bigfoot reports I have seen are from counties north and northeast of here. If you enjoy our content, please be sure to subscribe to our channel, like and comment down below, and follow us on social media. The links are in the description of this video and on our channel page. Also, if you've had an encounter and would like your story told here, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. As always, we look forward to hearing from you, and thank you for listening.